Evidence-based swallowing exercises, how to know which swallowing exercises work. Which swallowing exercises work and why? This is the question so many medical SLPs ask, and I'm here to help guide you through the weeds. Stick around to see the top three things I consider when creating a dysphagia therapy plan you can feel confident in. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. First, we have to figure out what is actually impaired. We develop a dysphagia therapy plan based on swallowing physiology. A physical therapist wouldn't create an exercise plan without targeting what's weak, or an oncologist wouldn't simply start chemo anywhere without finding the origin of the cancer. So why would we? I remember when I was fresh out of grad school, I didn't have much mentorship in the form of what to actually do with patients for exercises. Sure, we thickened liquids, we did chin tucks and all the compensatory strategies, but it wasn't until later in my career when I really understood a good exercise-based treatment plan. I remember being given a list of exercises to do with every patient, regardless of their impairments, and I just thought to myself, do I really need a master's degree and a brain to have every single patient do every exercise on this paper? That doesn't seem very skilled to me. And lo and behold, it wasn't. And that's when I really dove into learning more about dysphagia and how we treat it. And it all goes back to first knowing what the impairment is that actually needs to be treated. This is why instrumental assessments are so important. We don't wanna be doing exercises on the wrong impairments or even worse on ones that need medical intervention from ENTs or GIs before we even start our treatment. Before we get into some specific exercises, I first wanna mention that the best exercise for swallowing impairment is swallowing. Just like with anything else in life, the best way to see improvements is to practice what it is that you want to improve. Golfers practice golf, pianists practice piano, the same goes for swallowing. One important factor to consider here is neuroplasticity and its 10 principles. So I'm gonna go through them. Number one is use it or lose it. Just like with our limbs, if you stop using it, it can atrophy and we can lose all its muscle strength. Use it and improve it. Practice makes perfect. Specificity. In other words, how closely can you mirror normal swallowing during therapy? Repetition matters. Change or plasticity requires repetition. Intensity matters. Plasticity requires intensive training. Timing. Different forms of plasticity occur at different times in training. Salience. Neural plasticity may be enhanced when the movement is purposeful and meaningful to the person. Age. Neural plasticity occurs across the lifespan, but outcomes decrease with age. This is not to say that older people won't make improvements, but it can be slower or not as fast as younger adults or children. Transference. Plasticity in response to one area of training can enhance the acquisition of similar behaviors. And lastly, interference. The acquisition of other behaviors can be interfered by the plasticity in response to a different experience. I wanna share a story about a patient that I had about four years ago. He was a man that suffered from a brainstem stroke and was in the ICU for 43 days. He was in an ICU that unfortunately did not have an SLP on staff. By the time I got to see him, he was in a skilled nursing facility. He had been NPO for 43 days. And when I walked in, his wife was giving him a cup of water. I said, no, he's NPO. Does nursing know that he's having water or did they tell you that he could have water? Um, and his wife said, no, I don't think so, but I've been brushing his teeth and giving him a cup of water every few hours for the last few weeks. I was thinking he must be so thirsty. She said, I figured he probably just needs to start swallowing again and practice makes perfect. So I had him start swallowing. I honestly was so shocked at how critically ill and debilitated this man was, but his wife essentially rehabbed his swallow back on her own. I was shocked because it seemed like such a simple, it, it seemed like such simple common sense to her. And to us, we think it's this big neuroplasticity scientific thing, which it is, but it just goes to show that by her performing those repetitive actions of that specific skill, it really truly did work. So I don't recommend just having your critically ill patient start chugging water without an SLP. But for more information about the principles of neuroplasticity, check out that paper from Kleiman Jones. 
And a spoiler alert, there's also an entire chapter in my book, so you're having trouble swallowing, dedicated to exercises and neuroplasticity as well. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't wanna miss, so make sure to hit that like or subscribe button, leave a comment, or turn on the notification bell. Okay, now we'll finally get to some exercises here. After you know exactly what you need to target and how the principles of neuroplasticity work to actually improve muscle strengthening, what exercises should we do? Now, if you see decreased hyaluryngeal elevation on fees or on video fluoroscopy, we can do the effortful swallow, the Mendelssohn maneuver, falsetto, and the effortful pitch glide. If you see decreased upper esophageal sphincter opening or UES retention, consider the Shakir or chin tuck against resistance. If you see decreased anterior hyoid movement on fees or video fluoroscopy, consider the superglottic or super superglottic swallow exercises. These are just a few of the most common impairments and exercises that we have good evidence for doing. Now, the final point that I wanna say here is what does the patient want? Not all impaired physiology leads to a dysphagia exercise plan. And here's why. So in 1990, the Patient Self-Determination Act was put into effect. So this was put into effect for patients of Medicare and Medicaid, um, basically covering all skilled nursing facilities, home health hospitals. And what this said that, is that the patient is ultimately in charge of their care. So they can determine what they would like to do, what they would not like to do, what treatments they wanna be involved in, what assessments they wanna take part in. Um, so this really is a component of evidence-based practice as well with considering the patient preferences in all that we do. So does your patient even want to participate in swallowing exercises? Do they feel that there is even an impairment? These are all questions to ask ahead of time because a lot of times we're doing exercises with a patient that we think might help them or that we think is bothering them to come to find out that it's not something that really even bothers them. So I have a story to share about a patient that I saw gosh, about maybe seven years ago. I think she was 94 years old um, and they called me in to do a swallow study on her. She, they, they could not figure out what was going on because she was refusing to eat. She didn't want to eat any of the meals. They thought, thought it might've even been end of life. I uh, just wouldn't eat any of the cafeteria food at the nursing home, but she wasn't losing weight and they weren't quite sure what was going on. So I went in, I did the swallow study. She mentioned that she was having, you know, some throat tightness, but she couldn't quite explain what it was. Come to find out she had an impaired vocal fold um, and that was causing her airway to be wide open on some instances. Uh, she also had a secret stash of M&Ms in her nightstand that she was eating. So she would be eating the, the M&Ms and she was aspirating them left and right. So every M&M was going right into her airway. It was really mortifying to actually see on fees all of the M&Ms going down into her airway. So after we saw what we saw, I went out and I was, you know, starting to tell her son everything that we saw, you know, what I thought we might be able to do for therapy, that I might want to send her out for an ENT consult. And he said, you know, I don't know that this actually bothers her. And I don't know that this act, if, that she actually cares. And to me, I was like, what do you mean she doesn't care? And so I went in and I talked to her and I just said, you know, we, we've sort of discovered what's going on with your throat and what's going on with your swallowing. And, you know, I just wanted to talk to you about this treatment plan that we can put together and we can send you out to see an ENT. And she just said to me, honey, I don't care. I'm 94 years old. I just want to eat M&Ms. I don't care if they go into my airway. I don't care what my throat's doing. Um, so it was a really interesting lesson for me to learn because I did so much work in the background. I did this extensive chart review. I, I read through so much of her medical history. I had this great hypothesis in my head of how we were going to, you know, this great treatment plan we were going to come up with and how we were going to fix her swallowing. And she didn't care. She didn't want to participate. So this was such a big lesson to me in that we really have to listen to our patients and we really have to get to the bottom of what their wants and needs are. Um, and for this woman, it was not a treatment plan. If you're interested in more information about this topic, I've got a free resource for you that digs right into this. Check out the link below. And we also have our clipboard kit that covers all of this information as well. So both links are below in the description.